Hi there, let's take a look at building websites in Jamstack today. The title of this presentation is Building Faster Websites Faster. And what I mean by that is I actually think we can construct a website faster using the Jamstack methodology and then the output of that website, the actual thing that the user interacts with, I think will perform faster than a lot of the traditional paths that you might take like building with a traditional CMS. So hi, first of all, my name is Jim. I work at a company called Janku. And I'm an organizer of the Jamstack Boston meetup. And if you want to find me anywhere, you can basically search for Jim A. Fisk. That's on Twitter or YouTube or wherever you want to look. And let's start by defining what I mean by the Jamstack. So Jamstack is basically a methodology for building websites. It's not a specific technology. Anything that uses JavaScript APIs in markup in a certain way is a Jamstack based website. So those are the three general technologies that are used to make up the underlying stack. But the way that they're used is a very specific method that actually makes it a Jamstack site. So for instance, you can't have any server side processing. So there's no backend languages like PHP or Node.js or Ruby and everything that is built with build time rendering. So basically, Everything you're seeing is built before it gets deployed and then that whole site gets deployed to a server which the user interacts with. And now that server is usually like a content delivery network. So it's many edge nodes around the world so you can get content really fast. And a lot of people want to differentiate between traditional methods of building websites in the Jamstack. So for instance, like Drupal and WordPress are not Jamstack sites because they have that backend processing. They have databases, they have all those layers. Something like Ruby on Rails or Django is not either. And then sometimes people want to say, well, is like an isomorphic JavaScript app a Jamstack? And it's not necessarily. So something that's using like server side rendering to actually build some of those front end views is not a Jamstack site. You don't want anything on the server side of your actual base application to make it a Jamstack site. So Jamstack is growing in popularity. You probably heard of the name and maybe that's why you're curious about this presentation. So in our Jamstack Boston meetup, we actually have over a thousand members. I think we're up to 1,020 as of today. And it is growing in popularity. This is all kind of promoted naturally. We didn't haven't paid for any advertising or anything like that for our group. So people are just generally curious about this topic and you're hearing it thrown around a lot more. So hopefully we can identify any points of confusion in this presentation and we can actually clarify some of that and talk about the current state of where things are today and where we think they might go in the future with this paradigm. So on our agenda for today, we're going to start with what I'm calling the good, some of the benefits of Jamstack, then we'll move into the bad, and I'll go to some of the drawbacks. And then let's talk a little bit about the future and where I, th I think some of this stuff might go. So starting with the good, simplicity. So Jamstack really allows you to get back to the basics. And what I mean by that is basically web design is back. So I feel like a lot of the frameworks that are out there today make it so you can't really design websites anymore. You have to be a, an engineer with some real heavy coding chops. And I even mean that when it comes to things like front end designers with, with CMS backends. So for instance, using something like Drupal, which is a technology I use a lot, and I think Drupal is a really great technology, but the Twig front end of Drupal, I don't think is quite at the level of what I consider a pure design framework. So for instance, you still have to understand how to pull variables out of the database. You still have to often pre-process them with, with PHP code. And even if someone is doing that, you have to know how to unpack those in certain ways to use them on the front end. So I wouldn't consider it quite designing. I consider that more of an engineering role than a design role. So oftentimes designers are getting pushed more and more to the just Photoshop slash like GIMP uh, design side of things where they're drawing things up, but they're not touching any technology, which I think is kind of a shame because some of the front end technology could be more accessible to designers and it would allow that creative process to be a little more seamless. I think Jamstack's great because it allows you to actually focus on the front end and you can toss out a lot of the really complicated topics, which make up most of the complexity of a project like caching and databases and server side code. These things end up taking the majority of time to make a modern enterprise project secure and fast. So if you can toss out most of those concepts, then you can focus on a smaller subset of features and things that you have to actually focus on. And I think it's really great because basically what you're doing with the Jamstack is you're focusing on the templates, the making the markup 
work with a data source, which is usually something simple like a markdown file or a JSON API or something like that. And essentially the process is much easier to work with because you're, you're using a lot of the modern tools that you're used to using and you can get rid of a lot of that backend complexity that you really don't need in order to just design a website. And now sometimes people wonder like, well, isn't this something that we've been doing since forever? The early sides of the web were just HTML files. And are we kind of going back to that and we're kind of turning back the clock and is this more of like a, a retro thing or is this an actual modern thing that can be useful? And I think really the advent of continuous integration and continuous delivery is really making this whole paradigm possible and, and making this resurgence of this type of thinking. So I think there's a pretty big distinction between how things were set up previously when they were just HTML and how they're set up these days. So when they were just set up as flat HTML files, you had several challenges that continuous integration is, is really helping to solve. So one was your content was really interspersed within HTML code. And when you have to edit your actual content within a document like that, it becomes kind of challenging because you're mixing your structure with your actual copy. And that is kind of a challenge because it can get quite messy. And if you're not a technical person looking at that, it can be quite challenging. So I think the separation of concerns that you have with the templating and the data sources is really powerful in a Jamstack paradigm. So that's one thing. And the second thing is previously when they're flat files, you basically had to have lots of duplicates of things. So for every page, you basically would have a header and a footer that is duplicated across many pages. And this was okay for a small number of pages, but even when you get to about 10 plus pages, it becomes really annoying if you have to change like a, a menu link in your header. So you'd have to actually change that across many different pages in the traditional way. But here you can actually, since we're, we're integrating, we're building these assets, you can actually maintain those in one place a lot easier. So you can make changes in a, a very specific place and it can propagate throughout many different pages. And having that idea of building these sites with a Docker container using a continuous integration pipeline, it allows you to kind of make that a lot easier. So people can make edits in all sorts of ways and that can rebuild the site and bring all those things together and then deploy that. So this is a big innovation that has made the Jamstack rise in popularity. Another thing that the Jamstack helps with is speed. So you get performance out of the box without the headaches. Now, what do I mean by headaches? So basically traditional CMSs had performance but you'd have to work really hard to get them and they'd often be quite expensive to implement. So there's several levels of caching in a traditional CMS. So there's things like opcode caching. So that's converting your PHP into memory code, bytecode. And then, so an example that is APC, there's database caching. That's storing the result of DB queries into memory. And then that reduces the database traffic. So you can use memcache for something like that. And then there's web server uh, or reverse proxy retrieving pages from virtual memory that are being requested by the visitor. So something like Varnish. And essentially that's just building your web pages. Normally like when something like Drupal has to go and build a web page, it'll pull some information out of the database and then it'll kind of put a bunch of different templates together and slot that information into it. And then that pro the whole process is quite intensive and takes a lot of time. So in order to reduce the load of that, we basically keep that final built page product and we just serve that up really quickly to users. Now the Jamstack is kind of doing that by default. So the pages are all static by the time they've gone through the static site generator, which has been built using the CI process and then deployed to a CDN. So you're actually getting those already cached pages really fast and you don't have to do any of that work at any time because it's all done during the build stage. Now with that kind of process, you can move everything to the CDN. So a CDN is a content delivery network and it's basically a series of servers all over the world, which make it so if you're in a specific location, you don't have to request a server way on the other side of the globe, which has some transfer time limitations. So basically if I'm in Massachusetts over here, I might get a server that's close to my location here. So I don't have to pull it from a server way over here. And the idea that building this all into static assets, we can deliver the whole website to all these different edge nodes um, versus just previously with a CMS, you'd often have one specific server for your main body of your CMS and your database and things like that. And then you would distribute compiled assets like maybe your JavaScript and your CSS or maybe some images to these edge nodes all over the world, but that's only impacting part of what the website is. The server requests in the database still had to go to a certain location. And now we can kind of distribute that all across the globe, which makes things faster all around. Another benefit of the Jamstack is the security. So um, we have limited attack vectors with Jamstack. Basically we're trying to close any of those potential places where people could get into our site. 
and by having our front end just static and then only having dynamic aspects moved into microservices, we can limit those attack vectors and make them behave independently, which is nice. This is not to disparage other projects. I think the traditional CMS is great and still is the way to go for a large portion of web projects these days, but I just wanna talk about some of the challenges with some of those. So for instance, there's security patches that are rolled out all the time in something like Drupal. So it, this on the one hand is actually really amazing. So we have a dedicated security team in the Drupal project, which is crazy because you get these security patches, people are finding vulnerabilities and fixing them for you for free and you get to benefit from those as a community. So this also speaks to the strength of the Drupal project saying that 96 patches were rolled out in 2019. That's pretty amazing that that's all happening and we have such a lively community there. But one of the challenges is, is that's almost, it's close to two patches a week that you have to account for. And of course that's a little inflated because that's across many, many different projects and maybe your specific application doesn't have all those modules pulled into it, but you have the potential to every week be doing some work to update patches. And that becomes challenging depending on the type of project. So I used to have a lot of personal projects that I was running on a Drupal application and I was finding all these times where I wasn't really prepared for spending a couple hours to update websites and then I'd end up having to do it for all my personal projects and it was kind of frustrating to me. So a lot of those projects have moved to the Jamstack because those security concerns are taken care of for the most part. And a lot of the functionality that was required on those projects didn't warrant something that had the complexity of something like a CMS like Drupal. Another thing to be considered of is that 73.2% um, of websites, according to WPWhiteSecurity.com, is uh, potentially vulnerable for WordPress. Because people aren't always maintaining these things and they don't have the staff or the engineering capability to roll out new patches every week, then they miss some of these patches and their sites are actually potentially vulnerable to attack. So um, a lot of people I feel like aren't actually budgeting these security updates into their maintenance plans. They budget for a project and they have the design and the development of the project thought out and then basically the developer is fine taking that money and uh, or the designer and then they don't really communicate to the client that there's an ongoing maintenance that needs to be accounted for as well and so what happens is a lot of people are put in these projects without fully knowing the implications of what that is and then they're kind of shocked when they find that they're probably one of these 73.2 percent that's vulnerable so i think there's a lot of implications that people need to be considered of depending on the project structure they're choosing now, what I like about the Jamstack is that the clients don't always have to choose between security or money. So a lot of clients, you know, I, I think we like to focus when we're, we're doing these talks on the enterprise clients that have tons of money to throw at these projects. But a lot of people have budgeted a certain amount and it's for their website and they really are kind of like a set it and forget it client. And they're thinking, well, we budgeted this and we, we're either gonna have to be secure or we're gonna have to spend money that we don't necessarily have. And so what I like about the Jamstack is that we don't have any time sensitive updates that we have to make. So basically, once the site is compiled, it's generally secure. Now there could be some front end packages that have some security holes, so that's not 100% accurate, but for the most part, you're getting static assets that are pretty secure that don't need a lot of attention. They definitely don't need weekly updates to keep safe. What ends up happening is I find that my development process with clients that are on Jamstack is uh, it's a little easier of a sell for me because I can build the security update times into my dev time. So what I mean by that is previously, if there isn't a maintenance package in place, which is always a, a good idea to have if you're a development shop, but if you don't have something like that in place and security updates are coming and there are changes that are breaking APIs or whatever and you have to spend a lot of time to develop, oftentimes you're coming back to your client on a weekly or monthly basis saying, hey, I need to charge you again for the services that I've been doing. And often their response might be something like, I didn't ask for any changes or I didn't, you know, I'm not sure what's prompting you to charge me since I haven't done any of this. So you're, you're in this awkward position where you either aren't doing the quality of work that's required to keep something secure and fast, or you're asking your client to pay for things that they're not sure about that they've requested. So um, it puts you in a, an interesting situation, but with the Jamstack, basically, if there's any package updates or things like that, they're not gonna affect the security or the performance of your front end for the most part. And then once your client asks for a new feature in the future, you can kind of build in the time to update all the packages and the security and everything on your, your build time. You can package that into the feature that's being built so they're not surprised when they actually get a bill at the end of the day because they've actually requested something. So it makes those budget conversations a lot easier, I find, to actually to bundle security things the way that the GMSAC does it. And also it fits in with a smaller budget. So if you actually do have a truly set it and forget it type client, now I don't recommend that web projects be static and don't really update over time because there's a lot of advantages to having dynamic content and things like that. But assuming that you have a client that 
has those needs, you can do that with good conscience. You can put them on a site that is up and existing and you can have pretty good confidence that it'll be secure and up without being hacked by anybody. So you can feel better about those decisions. Okay, and then we can't really talk about Jamstack without talking about microservices. So this is basically a collection of loosely coupled services. And essentially what that is, the Jamstack doesn't have the backend. So if you need things like forms or commerce or comments or forums or any of those things, they basically have to be pulled out into separate services called microservices. And now the way I like to think about microservices, is if you're building a site, do you want to add the complexity now or do you want to add it later? And I think the way that the Jamstack does this by decoupling the services from the actual build of the site, it actually allows you to add these services one at a time, which is great for something called MVP or minimum viable product. And that's basically the concept of getting your smallest set of features out there and working in your most critical stuff and then adding to it over time. In my experience, that actually gives you a greater likelihood of having a successful project because if you try to do everything, if you try to build Facebook right off the bat, you have a greater chance of not building anything because the complexity is so high and the budget is so big and you can't put all those things together and you end up failing versus if you're trying to build one specific piece of functionality and do that really well and that's the core of your business, focus on that, get that running well, and then you can build out the nice to haves over time. And Jamstack really allows you to do that much easier. You can be more agile, you can build out that first iteration and you can test it and you can plan and then you can release a new version of it and then you can add services to it over time. And I find, although people try to do this with CMSs, oftentimes you have to architect those decisions into it from the onset and you have to do that very early on. And if you don't do that, you end up having yourself in a tough situation later on. So sometimes you get this mixture between an agile and a waterfall with a, a traditional CMS. So that's, that's one thing that Jamstack helps with. And then you also have the benefit that these microservices, they function independently. So say for instance, you have a comment section and a e-commerce part of your website, and those are probably two different services. And if one of those services were to go down or break, so your provider that is providing that, maybe they have an interruption to their servers or whatever it is, that service doesn't take down the other services and it doesn't take down your app as a whole. Now, if you compare this with something like a traditional CMS, so like if you have a shopping cart built into your content management system, if you break something on that shopping cart, there's a good chance you might take down the entirety of the website. And that's even talking about marketing pages that don't have anything to do with the shopping cart. So separating the services can help your app in that sort of way. Also, you can have a broken service that actually doesn't impact your production at all sometimes. So if you are pulling, for instance, pulling from a, a CMS that's an API, like content management system, and you're building that content into your website on build time, even if that content management system goes down, it is already incorporated into your site and you'll still be able to serve those pages to users like nothing is wrong with it. And then basically you can work with your provider to fix those problems and just have it ready for your next deployment. And no user will notice any difference there, which is really nice. And you can also mix and match providers. So that can be kind of nice if you find that one vendor does something very well, but does something else poorly. You're not stuck in using them for everything. You can independently choose which provider you want to use for which service. Okay. And then, so what are the options? Okay. Maybe you're sold, maybe you're not, but let's, let's pretend that you are. And how can you get started with using this Jamstack? So luckily there's a lot of great static site generators, which are going to be the base for how you're going to get started building these apps. Now I've listed eight here, but there's many, many more. So some of the popular ones, Hugo, Hexo, Middleman, Gridsum, Gatsby, Jekyll, Sapper, and 11T. I'm gonna focus on two of these. I'm gonna pick more popular ones. So Hugo and, and Gatsby here, before I go there, let's see. So if you wanna learn more about getting an intro to some of these, on our channel here, we have a Jamstack playlist, I guess it's called. And um, in there, we have a lot of the, the Boston Jamstack meetups in there, but we also have a tutorial. We have a 20 minute Hugo playlist there, which is just a basically, um, an intro to the Hugo static site generator broken down into 20 minute chunks. So you can go and get an intro to one of these um, static site generators that way. So check that out on our channel if you're interested. But okay, let's take a look at Hugo versus Gatsby. What you're first gonna notice if you're looking into these two different static site generator frameworks is you're gonna see that they're both claiming to be really fast and they're not the only ones out there. There's, there's plenty of static site generators out there claiming to be the fastest ones. So what do they mean by this? Which is actually faster? So Gatsby's fast in every way that matters and it's blazing fast websites and apps. Hugo is the fastest, uh, world's fastest framework and I've seen a couple challengers recently to that. What are they talking about when they're talking about that? Let's take a look here. Hugo, when they're talking about being fast, is they're talking about their actual compile time. So how long it takes to build a website. And what that means is if you have a thousand pages, Hugo's claim is that they're going to compile those 
thousand pages and that might be, you know, a thousand different markdown data sources going into several different templates to build static pages. Now, Hugo Claims is going to build those very, very fast for you. And in my experience, it's pretty accurate. Hugo builds pages super fast. And then another benefit Hugo has here is that the project structure is generally pretty simple. It is just a simple markdown data source with a simple templating structure here. So I think it's a little easier to get up and running with something like Hugo. There may be frameworks that actually have an even lower barrier. So Jekyll oftentimes is one that people think of as a really easy to get started framework for a static site generator. So you might want to look into something like that as well. Something I really like about Hugo is that it's a single binary that gets compiled. Basically, Hugo is a, a Go-based project and Go compiles down into a binary and basically a binary that runs on different operating systems. So if you're on a Linux computer, you get a binary for your Linux computer. If you're on Windows or Mac, you get the binary for those operating systems. And it doesn't have any dependencies. So basically you just download that file and it generally just works, which is something that I can't say I've had such a seamless experience with some other frameworks. So that's pretty nice and I really enjoy that with Hugo. Uh, another thing I really like about Hugo is it has an asset pipeline. So this helps you with any a JavaScript asset or CSS asset for style. And it basically helps you concatenate all these different files into one single file. And then it minifies them so it runs faster on your server. It'll fingerprint them so you can either cache them or break the cache when you make updates. So it does a lot of really nice things with your assets. And Hugo has that built in and it works pretty well. So I like that. And then there's some nice features like drafts and redirects and paginations and all the things that you really want to have kind of a fully fledged um, working website. Uh, Hugo builds a lot of those into it by default. Now Gatsby, on the other hand, we talked about Gatsby being fast. So I know it's a little out of order, but Gatsby basically makes the front end really fast. So it has something, it basically builds into a single page application. And when you do that, you can actually make things really fast because you can code split and you can link prefetch, basically meaning some of the data sources, and this comes down to like how you're importing different components in your project, but they can split in this, I think Gatsby does this uh, at the page level by default, but it, it breaks these pages into different data sources and then it prefetches them. So when you hover over a link to go to a new page, it starts fetching that data. And I think it's a JSON format, it starts fetching that data. So it loads really, really fast. And the page actually doesn't do a full redirect. You don't see your browser reload and then pull all those assets individually again, which is, is fast with static assets, but it also is time consuming. And Gatsby, it actually just reloads and pulls those assets and doesn't refresh the page because it's all a client side application. The whole application is built up client side. Now, it also has the advantage of if you don't have JavaScript enabled or whatever, it has a fallback. It actually builds static assets for each individual page as well. So you can actually navigate the sites built in Gatsby without that single page application being hydrated. But by default, if you have JavaScript enabled and that's all working, that's your fastest way of going. It also has this concept where it's built into like a content mesh that uses GraphQL. And it also has this huge ecosystem of plugins. And what I mean by that is basically you can pull from all sorts of different data sources. And a lot of those data sources are already figured out for you. So you can pull data from like a Drupal or WordPress site or any of the other CMSs. You can pull from Salesforce and all those plugins are kind of built out for you. So you can just pull them and then basically you're getting the data on in a GraphQL format. So you can basically query that data using the same format for no matter what the data source is. And then you can interact with that using the same GraphQL front end. So it basically makes your design team work in a standardized way, even though the back end might be pulling from many, many different places in many, many different formats. So that's pretty nice. I also like that it's based on a component based design. So it uses React, which forces the designer to think in components, which I think is a superior way to, to design some of these websites. It allows you to scope projects a little more efficiently and also reuse things in a more powerful and meaningful way. And I really like component-based design, so I like the fact that React forces you into doing that. And it has some nice features like in image optimization. So it'll load low quality, faster loading images at first. And then as the page loads, it'll replace those with um, higher quality images. So that's, that's pretty nice. You get that out of the box. Okay, so that's great. We have a lot of good stuff there. Well, now let's talk about some of the bad stuff that comes along with the Jamstack. So we have microservices and we said, well, I thought this was a benefit a minute ago. Is there a downside? Well, yeah, I think there is. You can have the situation where you have so many microservices. If you have a complex app, you often have to bring in many microservices that it gets kind of fractured. And you actually get to, in my opinion, a tipping point where managing these things independently is actually more challenging than managing them together into some single monolithic application. For instance, you have users like non-technical users, if they have to log in and they have to log into 10 different microservices, you've just made their life a lot more complicated. And most users who are not technical, in my experience, won't put up with the, the fact that they have to log into 10 different things independently. So you have to find a way to tie those together. That's a challenge. 
to make that seamless for your users. You also have developers who are now working with many different APIs and they have to understand how the intricacies of those. They have to be aware when one of these many microservices updates their API and breaks something on their site. They have to understand what's going on there and they have to be up to date with those products. So it can be quite challenging if you start adding many of these microservices to your application. So there might be a tipping point where it makes more sense to use a CMS where you can control that whole life cycle of your application in one place. And then you also have to think who's answering to whom. We have to think that we're buying these products. If we buy someone's service and they're answering to us, we're the customer, customer is always right. But really, if you build up a reliance on many third parties, they kind of own you a little bit more than you own them. And what I mean by that is let's assume that you have an application and you build it on a commerce platform and the application takes off and is really popular. And all of a sudden your microservice as handling the commerce, uh, they start raising their fees and they have a proprietary platform and you don't want to pay the fees that they're raising. It's like, well, you've built a really big successful platform here. And now it's really challenging to go and change that completely to another provider. Like it's going to take some real time and effort. So they've kind of locked you in here and you don't have a lot of say in how they're changing their pricing on you. So you kind of rely on that party and they're kind of locking you in and you lose some of your control over how you want to deploy things. So basically you're using someone's product unless you're rolling your own microservice, which is totally valid and you can do it. But you're using someone else's product, so you can't really control the decisions that are being made on that. So maybe they're they're rolling out features that you don't like or they're removing features that you love. So you're kind of at the whim of somebody here. And basically, you know, best case scenario, you have success and you build out a lot of your own features that are dependent on somebody. You're really locked into them at that point. So that is a challenge that I think you should be considering while you're building out these kind of applications. We also have to think about functionality. So where does Jamstack actually hit limitations? I made a little matrix here that I think helps identify some of this. So anything is really possible in the Jamstack. So all these things I've listed here are actually possible. And and some of them I've actually seen implemented, but let's just say that they're not always easy. And you might be able to figure these out easier in a different type of framework. So, you know, we always talk about, well, Jamstack's easy. It's better than these other frameworks in this way. It's like, well, then it's not fair to say that anything's possible and just deny the fact that some of these things are, are quite hard. So let's talk about authentication. So having many concurrent editors in your site is going to be hard with Jamstack. Saving user information and storing preferences, that's going to be challenging. Having dynamic roles and permissions, you can have different roles and permissions in your authenticated site, but those things are challenging and they're not as easy as a permission matrix that you get with a Drupal out of the box. Site building is not really going to be something that's easy. And now I have kind of a strong opinion on this. I don't think the idea of building site builder type functionalities into your frameworks, I I actually don't like. I tend to think that they end up being kind of uh, a contradiction. They You build them in there and they make it harder for your developer because now you have to accommodate this front-end framework. And then we often, in an enterprise environment, we don't allow our users to actually build with them. So we, we're carrying around all this baggage in our backend, but we don't allow our users to actually use them. So we're not getting the benefit of them. And then we have this weird situation where our content editors are getting a mix of site builder features with content editor features. And I think it adds to the confusion of the front end. So I'm actually not a huge fan of site builders built into frameworks like UI site builders. But if you're into that, you're not going to get that very well with the Jamstack, at least in the implementations I've seen. So designing layouts is going to be really challenging in the Jamstack. Content modeling, building that structure through the UI is not going to be easy. And building lists and reports and making those data relationships and displaying them is also not going to be easy through the UI anytime soon. And if it is, then maybe I'm wrong. Let me know in the comments. I'd love to see the implementations and maybe I'll change my tune on that. But that's kind of where I'm standing today. And then we have content challenges. So having a large number of pages or frequent updates is really challenging. If you have tens of thousands of pages, that build time is going to be really slow unless you're using something like Hugo that can build them quite efficiently. And many frameworks don't work even at a fraction of the efficiency of Hugo when it comes to compiling. So that's a challenge. And then frequent updates is also a challenge because you're constantly rebuilding that. And if there's any delays in the build time of your site, it's going to be delays to actually sending that to the front end to be displayed to users. So that's challenging. Also having UI tools like image croppers and entity references, those in my experience aren't quite there in a lot of these frameworks. So those things are challenging right now. And then moderation workflow. So Having things like drafts, need reviews, those are also challenging in the Jamstack. Now, not to say that they can't be accomplished. So the Netly 5 CMS, for instance, is a, a front-end React framework that allows you to, to edit your Jamstack sites. They have a concept of drafts, which is really clever. It actually works off of a GitHub backend and it, it creates a pull request and that's kind of 
sits into your draft and then you can approve it and then you can publish it and that basically merges your pull requests on the back end. So it's really clever, but I still think when you compare this to something like the moderation tools in Drupal, this is going to be severely limited. Also, you have this community consideration. So things like memberships with renewals or uh, messaging in forums or private content, that's all gonna be challenging in a Jamstack. Not to say that it can't be accomplished because it definitely can be. Okay, so in the downside category, what about Hugo versus Gatsby? Some of the things, and again, these are a lot of my opinions, so take these with a grain of salt, but some of the challenges with the Hugo is I think they use a lot of conventions. So there's concepts, and these are, they're powerful concepts. These could be also considered a benefit, but you, know, you have this concept of themes, which is you have to understand how template inheritance works. So you have to understand that a list in a theme can be overridden by a template higher up in the hierarchy. Um, so you have to understand that relationship. You have to understand the difference between list templates and single templates which is a strange concept, at least for me, is a strange concept to wrap my head around at first, why those things are distinguished in the way they are. They make sense to me now, but they're kind of a weird way of thinking. So you have to understand those kind of conventions with Hugo. Another thing that's a little bit challenging with Hugo is they use Go templates on the front end. So they can feel a little unnatural using that syntax for someone who's not familiar with Go. So for instance, their for loops are a range. And then the way they do the current context, they use this dot notation that might be kind of confusing to folks. So People who are familiar with some of the more popular front-end frameworks might feel a little out of their element when they come in here and they use something like Hugo because it uses a different paradigm. So I think that cuts down on some of the users who are willing to use something like Hugo, although I understand that there are architectural reasons why that is selected. And I actually do some Go development, so I actually like the Go templates. They work for me, and I think if you get used to them, then they work. But I think the first glance at it, if you're not in that world already, that it's a challenge to picking up Hugo for the first time. Also, it doesn't hydrate to a single page app, so that's not necessarily a bad thing, but you can lose some of that perceived performance on the front end if you're having a single page app that can load new pages really fast. So you lose some of that, you lose some of the uh, the popular component-based frameworks that force you to think in components. Now, I basically build all my Hugo sites in a component-based architecture, so you can do it, but out of the box, it's not really designed to make you think in that way. So you have to kind of bring that from your own experience. And then the last thing is it can't easily be extended. So because it's that single binary that I love so much, it makes it harder to extend it to pull from different data sources in the same way that Gatsby does. Gatsby using either Yarn or NPM to download different dependencies and string all those things up. I, although I find those package managers to be kind of frustrating managing those dependencies, they're nice because you have that ability to extend really easily. So Gatsby challenges. I think one of the biggest challenges with Gatsby is the build times are very slow. Even developing a page or a handful of pages takes a long time with Gatsby. It makes it really hard to have those real-time CMSs built into them. It makes it really hard to develop any site of any decent size. Now, I know Gatsby team is hard at work making things like incremental builds and Gatsby preview and all these different things built into their proprietary products. And I think that's really great. But I think the challenge of their open source free version that doesn't require a lot of building of different services together is that slow build time is really a challenge when using Gatsby, at least in the workflows that I've used in the past. Another thing that I find challenging with Gatsby is it requires a lot of setup to pull from different data sources. So even something like pulling from a simple markdown source out of the box doesn't work. So you actually have to string some of those together. You have to add some plugins that know how to read the markdown files. You have to write a little bit of boilerplate code to make new pages based on the markdown sources. And then you have to write some GraphQL queries to actually pull information from those sources and, and pull them in there. And it's not always the most straightforward way. So there's a lot of setup required to even pull anything, which I think is kind of challenging. The other thing I find is React can be kind of challenging for users. So people love React and React is one of the most popular frameworks. So I think that is definitely something going for it. And I guess this could definitely be a positive as well. But I think that React can be challenging, especially when you have a project that grows in complexity. I find that these components interact in very weird ways and they're not always, at least in the projects I've worked on, the most organized. And they can be quite challenging if you're not more of a heavy front end engineer oriented person. Like if you're just someone trying to build sites and, and you're coming out from a designer perspective, I think that this can get out of control really quickly if you're not careful. Okay, so that's where I think we are today. Here's some of the things I think are already going on currently, but I also think they are the future and I wanna see where these go and I think they could be extended even farther. So let's take a look at some of these. The, the big thing is I think the ecosystem for microservices and especially open source microservices needs to mature. And I think it's been happening. So this is from the Netlify website. So Netlify releases a lot of open source microservices. They have like a commerce microservice. They have an authentication microservice. They have a content management microservice. And these are all open source. A lot of them are based on Golang, which is pretty cool because I like Go. I'm a big fan of how Go does things. There are some people out there contributing to some of this stuff, but I think there needs to be a lot more 
in terms of documentation and just community use of them, people making YouTube videos, all those kind of things to make these projects reach a level of maturity. And I also think there needs to be obviously competition, other people creating their own microservices, maybe form like an open source form backend would be really nice. And I think as this matures, we're going to see a lot more people taking the Jamstack more seriously. So I think this is something that's been happening. There's been a crazy amount of progress. I salute all these the different companies who are contributing these things that are doing amazing work. I just think that this will continue to mature in the future. And this will also, as this type of thing matures, more and more people are going to start using the Jamstack because there's going to be lower barriers to using it. Now, another thing that I think is going to continue to mature is the static site CMS. So there's a couple different paradigms you can think of when you think of static CMSs. So there's the get back CMS and there's the API driven CMS. So the get back one basically commits different changes to the GitHub repository itself, which then kicks off a continuous integration process and rebuilds your site and then sends it back to the front end. The popular CMSs that are doing this right now are Tina and Netlify, and these projects are really awesome. I definitely recommend you check them out if you haven't heard or played around with some of these. And then there's the API-based approach, which is basically like a, a separate application that exposes the content from in the form of an API, typically like a JSON API or or something or a GraphQL endpoint or something like that. And popular ones are Strapi and Ghost. And now I haven't really used those, but those are uh, two very popular open source ones. And from what I've seen of them, they're really promising and really cool applications. You could insert many different applications here. You could insert like Drupal or WordPress. Any of those could be a backend API based content management system. And you could just use your static site on the front end. So these are really cool. I'm excited about both of these and I'd like to see how these projects all mature in the future. Now I'm particularly excited about the Get Back CMS. I think that at least to me that speaks to me in a way that I think it lends itself to the simplicity and the all inclusive bundle of the Jamstack. And I really like how those things are being implemented. So let's take a look at that. I have a couple of slides of quotes here pulled from this Netlify O'Reilly book, which I think is really great. So the first quote here is a save change in the CMS. And they're talking about the Netlify CMS is really made as a Git contribution behind the scenes. That's a powerful in that developers and editors are working in the same Git based work stream, modifying the same files using whichever method is most comfortable to them. So what they're saying is we're all speaking the same language here. We're all speaking Git finally. So the developer is speaking Git by building out features and developing and Git using, maybe they're using VS Code or they're using all their local tools and then they're tracking in Git and they're pushing to GitHub. Now content editors are just editing things on a website through what looks like a CMS. And yet they're still speaking Git. So at the end of the day, the developer can see exactly what the content editor is doing in the language that they prefer. And the editor can see what the developer is doing in the language that they prefer. Yet they're all using the same common language. It's a really powerful concept. And let me just extend that a little further. So this is a quote from the same book. In the Jamstack, it's possible and common for the content of site, blog posts, etc., to live in a Git repository along with the code and templates. This means that no content database is required, making Jamstack sites dramatically easier to set up run, deploy, branch, and modify. And in this version control centric world of the Jamstack, every deploy of the site is atomic, making it trivial to roll back to any state at any time for any reason. So I think this is really powerful. And I've done a couple of talks, Jamstack Boston meetup a long time ago about the, setting up the Netlify CMS. And I've had people challenge the idea of putting all their content in the repository like this. Some people really, really hate the concept of doing this. They think it's kind of messy to mix the content with the code. Now, I personally don't have a problem with that. And maybe it's just, really speaks to the type of projects I normally take on versus the type of projects that other people normally take on. So I really like the idea of having my content in my repository like that because I've often been in situations where I'll have something like either my permissions weren't set appropriately on, on a CMS or something where I allow people to, instead of just unpublishing content, I allow them to accidentally delete content. And oftentimes it will happen where a client will come to me and say, hey, this page, I accidentally deleted this. Can we get this back? And now we have to go through a process of restoring SQL databases, maybe even going as far back as restoring a snapshot of a server, and then looking through the database, maybe querying it, pulling that out, recreating it. It's really quite a process just to restore something like a simple deletion of a page. And now Jamstack, having that in there, I can go back in my Git history and I can look through it and I'm very comfortable in that type of environment. And I can find a commit, I can find the commit where it is, I can revert that commit easily, I can copy and paste from it, I can do all sorts of things with it. And I'm very comfortable using that in my own workflow. And I love that kind of workflow. And I'm not really too worried about a bloated repository with lots of content changes. That bothers some people, it doesn't bother me, maybe it bothers you, but I really like the idea of having a self-contained application where it's all working off the same repository, it's all using the same tools and it's all speaking the same language. For me, this is the future, it's the present, and I really like the way that this is set up. 
And then basically down here, when they talk about atomic deploys, that basically is referring to the concept of the site builds and only once it's passed tests and everything has been built, does it actually deploy the site. So you don't get the half broken sites that you might get in the past where, you know, something worked and that's deployed, but the broken thing doesn't deploy and you have this half built site. So atomic deploys make it really easy to go back to a complete, fully working version of the site. Okay. So what about site building? Now we talked about site building a little bit on some of the previous slides. Now I'm not a fan of building a site builder into a front end application. I think typically leaving that to people who are designers and developers is the best scenario. And those people want to use their own tools and they don't typically want to use your custom UI, which is different for every application that tries to design one of these. Now I could be wrong about that. And maybe people have different opinions, but I think when you build those into systems, then you end up having to carry around the baggage of building those things into the developer experience. And that makes things harder for everybody. So I, when I talk about site building, I'm not talking about building a site builder in here. I'm talking about really lowering the barriers for non-technical users. Often that includes aggregating and integrating microservices. So things like people should be logging into one place, not five or six, 10, 20, or whatever different applications, because that's kind of untenable for most users. So how do we integrate this? So you're logging into one place, but using multiple services. People that are building experiences like Stackbit is, um, where they're allowing you to choose generators and themes and services and cobble them all together for you. I think those things are really great. Things that Netlify is doing with deploying sites and building forms, and I think all those things are awesome. So I think building the right things to make those configurable and lowering those barriers for non-technical users is the future. And I think we have to find out the right places to do those. And everybody's gonna have a different threshold for what they think is right here. I have my own opinions and I'm sure people watching this have their opinions as well. But I think we need to integrate these services in ways that make it easier for the user, but don't complicate the things in some of the shortcomings that we've done in the past with other technical solutions. And then I just wanna talk about potential here. So I think there's plenty of potential. This is a little play on a project that we're considering building ourselves over here at Janku. And the idea is, can we bring some of these things together in a way that brings the best of all worlds, at least in the way that we're visualizing things on our team. So the Get Back CMS is something that we're mostly excited about. So can we have closer integration in the Get Back CMS with some of these solutions? I'm thinking maybe even something that's really built into the generator out of the box that is kind of blending the worlds of a fully based solution with a purpose-built tool. And I think so... For instance, using Netlify CMS, I think is an awesome CMS, but one of the challenges I've had when I've used this, I've used it with Jekyll and Hugo in the past, and I think it's a really, really great solution. And I think Netlify CMS and Tina are the furthest along in terms of maturity and innovation, and I think they're awesome projects. But one of the challenges I've had with Netlify CMS, and I think this will probably be addressed in the future, but oftentimes I'm building my data structure in my own markdown files and in my archetypes and things like that. In Hugo, I'm building my data structure out and I'm building a specific kind of component-based architecture with that data source. And then Netlify CMS data source is kind of duplicating some of the effort because they have their own way of building modular content widgets and things like that. And so you have this other kind of data source that is similar, but it's built in its own sort of way. So a closer integration of those where they're both the CMS and the templates are feeding off the same type of data source, I think would be really powerful and it would make this whole implementation easier for folks. So I think a lot of folks aren't using these solutions because there's just small little barriers to using them. They're really powerful and they'd really make your life so much easier if you implement them, but there's these little barriers that are getting in the way. The other thing is things like previews. So Netlify CMS is using a React front end. So oftentimes if you are building a component-based architecture and you're using these Go templates, if you want the preview to work, like where you're adding new components and you want those to be built in a preview, you're probably gonna have to rebuild those components again using React and using the convention that the Netlify CMS wants. So you're building components in two different places and that on a larger scale implementation can become quite untenable pretty quickly. So I think there's a challenge there that needs to be addressed. Another thing that needs to be addressed is these sites need to be compiling fast. So I think Hugo is addressing that. I think things like Rust-based static site generators like Cobalt are doing it. But the compile times need to be really, really fast in order to make a get back CMS work. The idea of editing something on the front end and having that actually come back to users in a timely manner, I think is gonna be super important here. So I think that needs to be a focus. And then I think another thing that would be beneficial is having the CMS built with the same front end framework that's using the templates. So again, it goes back to the challenge of your content management systems built in React, but your templates are built in Go templates. So you're kind of duplicating efforts. It'd be nice if those efforts were combined into one seamless framework and one seamless component if you're doing a component-based design. Also limiting dependencies, this is challenging. So if you want to be able to make it extensible, which is 
um, something I would want, but also limiting the dependencies. I like the idea of single binaries, but there's challenges with that as well. So finding the balance of best of both worlds there would be great. I think when you have a framework that requires a lot of install a bunch of packages, build these things together, cobble them together, update your manifests or whatever, those things are challenges to people who aren't familiar with these things. And I really like the idea of a low barrier to entry framework that allows people to get in and started with it and use the advantages of a lot of these things without the uh, stringing these concepts together themselves, which is challenging. And some people like those challenges and definitely those frameworks being flexible have a lot of advantages to them, especially people who are been engineers for a while. There's, there's huge advantages to it. But for other folks who are kind of getting into this and getting their feet wet and want to just build stuff and be productive fast, I think we need to limit those dependencies. And also I think enforcing component-based design. So I like the idea, even though I complained about convention earlier, I like the idea of enforcing convention to make things easier to document, make people easier to share information and show the way that you're supposed to do things. I think something like Ruby on Rails was really popular because they emphasize convention over configuration. And then having like a right way to do things and guiding people, I think can have a huge advantage. So at least that's what we're looking for when we're trying to think about what we're here at Janku might develop in the future in terms of our projects, which we're planning on making all open source. So if people are interested, you know, come contact us. Maybe we could definitely use some help on some of this. Okay, well, this is a presentation that's meant for questions or thoughts. So if you have those, please just put those in the comments. We like to actually read those in and get back to folks. And then we can always open up a conversation if people want to talk later. If you want to get in touch with me, you can always find me online, Jimmy Fisk, or just send me an email. Uh, thanks for, for listening to our talk, and we'll be in touch soon. All right, take care.